Is it still hoarding if the things you hoard are priceless works of art and you end up donating it to public institutions? Yes? No? Heroes, I'm Tempest, and welcome to Time with Tempest, where today we're going to be talking about the greatest art collection in the world, and the man who made it all possible, John Pierpoint Morgan. If you want to learn more hidden history, make sure to subscribe, bang that bell, distribute your delight, and leave your calling card in the comments. Now, let's begin our story. John Pierpoint Morgan Sr. was born in Hartford, Connecticut on April 17, 1837, as the son of a prominent financier. His early life was not easy, as he suffered from seizures, rheumatic fever, and rosacea, which would eventually get worse. Despite these setbacks, he received a good education in Connecticut and Massachusetts, before attending university in Switzerland and Germany. Afterwards, he went into banking in London at his father's merchant banking firm. He later came back to America, went to New York, avoided serving in the Civil War by paying for a substitute, and continued to focus on building up his father's firm. You could say this was a successful endeavor, because by 1900, it was one of the world's most powerful bank houses. His special skill was taking struggling businesses and reorganizing them to make them profitable. Investors soon took notice, and J.P. Morgan made his fortune. He was so wealthy that he and the Rothschild family bailed out the federal treasury during the Panic of 1893. And when there was another panic in 1907, he pledged his own money and convinced others to save the country. This spurred the government to create the Federal Reserve System as they feared another panic without the assistance of the aging J.P. Morgan. While there were other wealthy men in the Gilded Age, like John D. Rockefeller Sr., who, to be honest, his son was probably a better philanthropist than him, Andrew Carnegie, library lover, super intellectual, and hella generous, John Jacob Astor IV, literal hero who refused a seat on a lifeboat during the Titanic sinking, giving it to a mother and child, he was also a science fiction writer, inventor, and real estate king. Cornelius and William Vanderbilt, who liked establishing places and also art. Henry Clay Frick, another awesome art donor, which you should totally check out the Frick Collection in New York City. I highly recommend it. The Guggenheim Family, Guggenheim Museum, anyone? Ben Guggenheim was a literal hero as well, also giving up his seat on a lifeboat during the Titanic sinking, saying, No woman was left on board this ship because Ben Guggenheim was a coward. John Pierpoint Morgan was a titan in the Gilded Age for his selflessness and understanding of the greater good. But he was also a man of industry, and he had his hands, and money, in just about everything. From Edison's Illuminating Company, resulting in his home becoming one of the first private residences in the United States to be electrically lit, to funding the work of ethnologist Edward S. Curtis, which allowed Curtis to record and photograph the traditional life of over 80 Native American tribes. His material, in almost all cases, is the only written history on those tribes. I can't even begin to describe how important this work is, so I'll save it for another video. He even tried to get in on the London underground business, but alas, was thwarted. Luckily, he thrived in the railroad industry in America, and later steel. With such vast interest in ventures, it's no wonder his collection was equally as vast and diverse. The Morgan Library and Museum states his collection is encyclopedic and encompassing virtually the full range of artistic and human achievement in Western civilization, from antiquity to modern times. His collection was held at his various homes, from 14 Prince's Gate in London to 1219 Madison Ave in New York, and later the Morgan Library, which is around the corner from 219. His London home was particularly stuffed due to the art import tax prior to 1909 in America. Due to overflow, he loaned part of his collection to the Victorian Albert, which was as much a place for people to enjoy his collection as it was a convenient storage facility. 
It's estimated that by 1912, he had spent $60 million on art, roughly the equivalent of $1 billion today. Let me repeat that. Dude spent $1 billion on art. And his collection is far, far more valuable than that. He has three out of 49 Gutenberg Bibles, a Shakespeare first folio, original sheet music by Mozart, and this just casually hanging out in his study. No one before or after has ever bought or donated a fraction of what he did. Now before I start talking about the collection and its caretaker, I just want to let you know some amazing resources I found on J.P. Morgan and the Gilded Age. I've put links in the description below on some books and a fabulous History Channel series if you're interested in learning more. Now you may be wondering, how do you even maintain such a vast collection? And how do you transform a private collection into a public one? Enter Bella da Costa Green. She was the private librarian for J.P. Morgan, and later the librarian and director for Morgan Library. She had been introduced to Morgan by his nephew, who knew her from Princeton University, where she worked in the library, passing as a white woman. Though she later revealed herself to be a woman of color, it was of no consequence to the Morgan family. She was an expert in illuminated manuscripts and trusted with millions of dollars to transform the collection into what it is today. She was also known for her unmatched bargaining skills, her magnetic charm, and her incredible fashion sense. She once stated, just because I am a librarian doesn't mean I have to dress like one. The sometimes gruff Morgan was even won over by her, and they remained close friends until his death. She herself died two years after retiring from the library, having worked with the collection for over 50 years. Today, she is considered to be one of the most important librarians in all of American history, and her contributions to the collection are immeasurable. If you want to learn more about her, there is a fantastic book which I highly recommend. I will link it down in the description below. All right, we've spent all this time talking about the collection, so let's explore it. J.P. Morgan was a man who enjoyed surrounding himself with beauty. My favorite quote of his, no price is too high for an object of unquestioned beauty and known authenticity. And he certainly followed that philosophy. Pierpoint had always been a collector, even as a young child, when he collected autographs. However, he only began seriously collecting in the last two decades of his life, from the 1890s to his death in 1913. And once he semi-retired in 1901, it was on. Illuminated manuscripts, centuries-old drawings, some by masters of the Renaissance, and of course books form the core part of his collection. But he was an equal opportunity offender, sometimes traveling to Egypt to buy huge lots of items that had recently been uncovered, or handpicking miniature portraits to display in his London home. He was collecting at such a rapid rate, he soon earned the nickname The Magnet, and had political cartoons depicting him attracting all sorts of antiquities. Before I continue, I feel I should actually show you the collection I've been prattling on about, so here's a little montage I made to show you just how important this collection is.
can you see why I'm so stoked about this subject? Not only did J.P. Morgan amass one of the greatest, if not the greatest, collection of art and antiquity the world has ever seen, but what he did next was unthinkable to the rest of the art world. You see, once an object is purchased for private collection, it disappears. Poof. There's no record of who owns it, where it is, what collection it's in, or if it even still exists. Like this famous Van Gogh portrait which may or may not have been cremated with the man who bought it for his private collection. Or a sword, possibly belonging to Edward III, disappearing into a private collection in Germany. Precious items and the possibility of new groundbreaking research disappear with the object. And with such a void of knowledge, sometimes art historians label a piece as lost, only to have a collector reappear with it like... Oh, this Caravaggio? I didn't think anyone wanted to know about its existence for the past 400 years. I mean, is it really that important? Um... Yes. And this is actually a true story. Here's the painting. Anyway, once something ends up on the market, it rarely ends up in a public institution, and sometimes it's lost forever. So you can understand why Morgan's collection was so monumental. He saw himself not as an owner, but as a guardian, entrusted with the care of the history of Western civilization. And as the benefactor to such museums as the American Museum of Natural History, the British Museum, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where he was also the president, he had an open line of communication with all these museums. He would regularly loan objects to different museums and ensure they had top-notch care which is why they're in such remarkable shape today. Sadly, while he was in Rome, he passed away in his sleep, just shy of his 76th birthday. The Pope himself was said to be greatly distressed over his death and lamented the fact he could never see his friend again. The world mourned, with flags flown at half-mast and the stock market closed as his body made its way through New York City until it came here to his final resting place. This is Cedar Hill Cemetery in Hartford, Connecticut, the place of J.P. Morgan's birth. Most of his family is here with him under this monument, modeled after the Ark of the Covenant. It appears that in death, as in life, John Pierpoint Morgan is surrounded by beauty. In his final will, he stated that his objects were to be permanently available for the instruction and pleasure of the American people. You see, his endgame wasn't to hoard art and artifacts. It was to enjoy them while he could, care for them, and then eventually share them with the world. His collection of books, manuscripts, and drawings all stayed with his library. The rest were donated. The Metropolitan Museum of Art received over 7,000 objects, of which many are still on display to this day. The American Museum of Natural History received 16,918 specimens with rare gemstones and pearls the world had never seen. And the Wadsworth Athenaeum, right here in Hartford, received 1,300 objects, highly treasured and greatly admired. Finally, in 1924, his son Jack Morgan, with the help of Bella de Costa Green, fulfilled J.P. Morgan's dream and turned the Morgan Library into a public institution. So the next time you find yourself wandering the Morgan Great Hall in the Wadsworth Athenaeum, gazing at a masterpiece of the Renaissance at the Met, or reading one of the rarest books in the world in the Morgan Library and Museum, give a tip of your hat to the man who made it all possible. Thank you so much for watching. I upload videos every Friday or every other Friday for bigger videos, like the one coming up, which I will upload on October 23rd. You won't want to miss that one. And if you liked what you saw, remember to subscribe, bang that bell, distribute your delight, and leave your calling card because the YouTube algorithm gods demand it. Until next time, stay curious, history heroes.